few weeks ago, I showed you a game with the Rossolimo variation. e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop b5, that's the Rossolimo, where black played knight f6. And this was the system that I recommend in my anti-Sicilians course on chessable. And the game went like this, e5, knight d5, castles knight c7, there was an exchange here, and h3, that's an inaccuracy, and then h6 and black built a beautiful kingside attack with g5. Very logical when there's a hook here and you can try and open the g-file. Really nice game, that was Yannick against Pultinevicius. So let's go back to this position. Now, after I posted that video, uh, one of my regular viewers, René Calmes from Luxembourg, was inspired to play knight f6 in one of his games. And we're going to see that game now. Thank you, René, for sending it to me. Uh, before we get into the game, I should say that many people have been asking me, will there be a book version of my Chessable Anti-Sicilians course. Yes, there will be. I'm writing it as we speak. Um, assuming that I hit the deadlines, then it'll be appearing in the spring, uh, but I'll keep you updated as to my progress. There's always a lot going on, but yes, a book version will be appearing of the Anti-Sicilians course. Right, let's crack on with this game. So this is game, this game is played between Daniel Karp playing white, and René Calmes playing black. It was played in the Luxembourg Team Championship just a few weeks ago in November. So knight f6. Now, what's the point of knight f6? Well, it forces white to do something about the e-pawn. So do you push forward? Do you protect it? You know, do, you, do you exchange here? So white already has to make a decision, and compared to the main lines with g6 and e6, where white has the time often to play c3 and d4, then white doesn't have that luxury when this is attacked. So this is one of the points of it. And often I've found when I've played this move that it rather cuts across the plans of my opponent. So in this game, e5 was played. That's no problem because actually the knight finds a good square on d5 and once this pawn advances then the squares either side of it are, are, are free for black's pieces. So we've seen castles played in that game I mentioned earlier. If you haven't seen that before then I'll put the link down there. Um, bishop takes knight played here. D, t d takes. Now that's a very important part of this system. We need to develop quickly, and this bishop is now able to get into the game via f5 or g4, sometimes even e6. Now, if white were to play h3 to stop that bishop getting into the game, then there's always the danger that this pawn could advance and use that h3 pawn as a hook to open this file. So white didn't do that. White played castles. Having said that, bishop g4 is actually really annoying. Good move. Um, nice pin. You know, there's no light squared bishop to, to break that pin. d3 played. Now there's no need to play g6 and bishop g7. e6 played. And one of the reasons for playing e6 rather than g6 is that, of course, the bishop can just retreat to g6 if it's pushed. Of course, black doesn't need to exchange bishop for knight here. Usually best to keep the bishop. Knight d2. Here, René played bishop e7. I think that's very sensible. The move I would like to play is this move g5 again to crack things open on the g-file. But in that case, actually, knight e4 is a good move. Look at these squares. A little bit concerned about that. And if g4, which is not a problem, there's a pin here. 
and then you play c4, push the knight, and then knight f6 check. So the tactics just aren't working for black there. Bishop b7 played. Rook e1, yeah, well, the rook needs to support this pawn. Usually comes here. Castles, yeah. Very sound development for black. Pin is still mildly annoying. The knight is in a good position. So far, so good. Knight e4. Now, René played h6, and he said he didn't want to allow bishop g5 exchanging pieces. Fair enough. I mean, the, the, the pawn move is, is quite useful anyway, because it, it means, in some cases, that um, you know the, the, the bishop has a retreat there. So, let me see. Knight g3 played. So that pushes the bishop back. Still no need to exchange off bishop for knight, even though it might seem as though that bishop isn't really achieving very much here. In fact, this has the potential to be a fantastic piece. You've got to love your bishops. It's very important. And both those bishops have real potential. Now, white plays a slightly, slightly strange move here. Queen d2. I mean, queen e2 looks more normal, uh, although um, it's not absolutely clear to me what white is doing in this position, frankly. I think the idea of queen d2 was perhaps to cover the c3 square so that perhaps white wants to play b3 and then bishop b2. But actually, tactically, it's just not working. In fact, black already has a very good move here, and this is strategically, this is what black wants to achieve. It's possible to play c4 straight away. It's a good move. If this pawn can be isolated, then obviously black has achieved a great deal. And if pawn takes pawn, then knight b4 is really strong, looking at c2. And you can see that that bishop on g6 is well and truly in the game and playing a really important role. But Queen C7 played instead. Doesn't spoil Black's position in any way. If B3, this wasn't played, but I suspect that White now realised this is actually isn't a very good move. Because C4 again. And if Pawn takes, then Bishop B4 wins material. That's why white played a3. But you can see these moves are just too fiddly. In the meantime, black has played some really useful moves. The rook is now opposite the queen, which is really unpleasant. Unpleasant for, for white, that is. b3, okay, finally. And that stops c4, but b5 is a really natural move, which just kind of reinstates this threat. Bishop b2, and once again, c4 is actually a really strong move. It gives black the advantage. But instead, René played a5, also very strong. He's hit upon another way to attack on the queen side, and, and this pawn push, a5, a4, is really powerful. In fact, another way of undermining the pawn on d3. Queen c1, the queen step back, understandable. Surely didn't enjoy sitting opposite the rook. Knight b6. So this prepares the pawn breaks. Knight e4 played. And a4. It's really powerful. So the threat is to exchange here. And then it's possible to take that pawn there. And positionally, this is so difficult for white now. I mean, there's really uh, no chance to, to break from black's bind. Knight d2 played. Pawn takes and knight takes. Doesn't really help. c4 comes. And it's really strong. Pawn takes pawn, knight takes. Right, what's black achieved over the last few moves? Well, first of all, that's a beautiful piece on c4 looming over into white's position, looking at some very sensitive spots. That's beautiful. Can't be shifted. Got isolated pawns on c2 and a3. 
both could be vulnerable. The bishop on b2 is completely misplaced, it's just blocked by the pawn on e5. All in all, it's an absolutely rotten position. Oh yes, and this bishop is absolutely wonderful, looking at the knight, but beaming down to the pawn on c2 as well. I honestly find it very hard to suggest any good move for white here. F4 played, but that one, I think, makes things even worse because the king opens up now, not only along this diagonal, but along the second rank as well. And now simple chess from René, good move, just double on the d-file, why not? I mean, there's lots of good ideas here, but yeah, why not bring the rooks into play? Because white's rooks are split, they're not connected, the queen stands in the way, which means that black is able to conquer the d-file. Good idea. Knight c3 pushes the rook back, but curse comes to d7 anyway. King h2, yes, the king was feeling the heat here. And rook d8. Excellent chess. There's no need to be flashy here with black. Doing the simple things well, putting your pieces in strong positions, is quite sufficient. White tries to break out with a4, but b4 pushes the knight back. And c5, so there's the potential for the knight to move and then c pawn to push on again. Rook a2, pretty miserable. Queen c6, that comes to this beautiful diagonal, and white is really feeling the lack of a light squared bishop. Remember, that was exchanged off on move 5, and white is paying the price. C3. Well, there are lots of ways to win here. René played rook d3, just invading with a rook. But you could also play rook d2, for example, hitting the seventh rank. And I honestly don't see a way out for white in that position. Bishop can't move because of the pin. The rook can't move because of the knight. The knight can't move. Checkmate here. On the next turn, knight e3 is coming. I mean, it's completely winning for black. But rook d3 played instead. Also very good. Bishop a1. Bishop h4. There we are. I told you. Both bishops. Incredibly powerful, really important pieces. So that cuts down to the rook. If g3, then the queen invades. So rook f1. Knight e3. It's all happening now. Mate threatened on g2, so rook f3. And knight takes pawn anyway. So that's threatened, so rook takes, rook takes. So at the moment, black is a pawn up and the king is just getting ripped apart. However, René said that he had overlooked this move, queen h1. You can see there's a pin here. In fact, it doesn't spoil things at all. I mean, there are various ways out here for black. And uh, René played a good move. Bishop e4, holding the knight. Now, that gets pushed. And then gets pushed by the pawn again. But there are lots of ways to win this. Um, René chose bishop takes pawn. And this is good. Even though he's now piece down. In fact, White's position is such a wreck. These pieces are so ill-coordinated that there is no way out. So Queen takes Knight played, Queen takes Knight. The White is still a piece up, but it's completely winning for Black. Because look, the Rook is attacked. The Knight can't move because there'll be a check on g3 and then rook d1 check. So, well, let, let's try this one. Knight g1, at least that, that sort of guards the first rank. But this didn't happen, but let's, let's just have a quick look. Check here, b3. <laughs> the pawns are pretty good as well. Rook d1. And queen takes. Okay, let me see what's the score. Black has four pawns for the piece. And white is completely tied up here. 
But in the game, rook was attacked, rook b2 played, rook d1, attacking this one, queen g4, attacks the bishop, so it came back, and here white resigned. It's impossible to prevent rook takes bishop. I mean, it's rather a cruel finish where this bishop is completely blocked out of the game by the rook. All white pieces are pretty dreadful, actually. Complete domination. So yeah, black is about to play rook takes bishop and then you're a couple of pawns up and these pawns look fantastic. And yeah, it is utterly lost. So, well, congratulations to, to René. Thank you for sending the game to me. I thought it was an excellent illustration of what can happen in these kind of positions where white exchanges on c6. And you'll notice that actually white had problems on the light squares all throughout this game. And that was because of the exchange here. So, yeah, right, you know, when we get to a position like, let me plump for this position. Yeah, bishop e4, you can see it. On these light squares, white is really suffering, and that's a big theme of this game. And the other theme of the game is that break with c4, uh, which finally came in this position. Very, very common idea where you station the rook on the semi-open file and you look to break open the queen side very often with this move c4. Lovely game. So I repeat, if you're interested in my anti-Sicilians course on chessable.com, then do check it out. I'll put the link below. And yes, a book version will be appearing sometime in the spring. I better get writing. <laughs>